Let me share a story with you. There was once a little boy that lived on a farm in the country. One evening, he left his teddy bear outside. And that night, he tossed and he turned. He tried to sleep, but he couldn't. Finally, he went over to his daddy and said, Daddy, wake up. I left my teddy bear outside in the front yard. I need it to sleep. His father, who was half asleep, turned over and said, Well, son, go out and get it. The boy looked out the front door, but he couldn't see anything at all. There was no moon out that night, and it was pitch dark. He went back, and this time he woke up his mother. And he said, Mommy, I've left my teddy bear outside. I need it. I can't sleep. And she said, Son, here is a flashlight. And he turned it on and put the beam of light out the door. But still, he couldn't see far enough. He couldn't see his teddy bear. He went back into his parents' room and he talked to them together. And they said, son, when the flashlight was on, could you see far enough for your first step? And he said, yes. They said, well then, step on that step. And when you step on that step, you'll be able to see another step. Step on that step, walk in the light. And he did so. He walked in the light of that flashlight one step at a time. He couldn't see where he was going, but he walked in the light. And he was able to get his teddy bear and go back to sleep. There is an important lesson for us. We need to walk in the light, the light of God. It says in the Bible, Let your light so shine before humans that they may see your good works and glorify your God which is in heaven. Matthew 5, verse 16. When you allow the light of God to come through you, you will illuminate darkness in others, and they will be able to walk in your light also. Human touch is higher than high tech. We forget about that. We sit in front of our high tech computers and we think that's the smartest thing in the whole world. But we're smarter when we become a light for God. We need to go the extra mile with each other and for God. We need to do what Jesus said that we could do to become a point of light in our world. Faith is not a spectator sport. Life is not a spectator sport. Life to be life, it has to be lived. It has to be alive in you this very moment. One day, a naturalist was passing a farm, and he saw in the barnyard a flock of chickens, but among them was an eagle. The naturalist inquired of the owner why it was that the eagle, the, the king of birds, could be reduced to living in the barnyard with the chickens. Well, said the farmer, since I've given a chicken feed, it thinks it's a chicken. It has never learned to fly. It behaves as a chicken behaves. So it no longer thinks of itself as an eagle. Still, said the naturalist, it has the heart of an eagle. Surely it could be taught to fly. After talking it over, the two men agreed to find out whether this was possible. Gently, the naturalist took the eagle in his arms, looked into his eyes, and said, You belong in the sky, not on the earth. Stretch forth your wings and fly. The eagle, however, was confused. He did not know what was going on? And looking back, seeing the chickens down there eating their food, he jumped down to get some of that food for himself. Undismayed, 
The naturalist took the eagle the following day to the roof of the house and urged him, saying, You're an eagle. Stretch forth your wings. Fly. But the eagle was afraid of the unknown world out there, unknown self, and he jumped down once again to have some of the regular food for the chickens. On the third day, the naturalist took the eagle to a very high mountain, and there he held up the king of birds and urged him to fly, saying, You're an eagle. You belong to the sky, not to the earth. Stretch forth your wings and fly. The eagle looked backwards in the direction of the barnyard and up to the sky and was confused, still did not fly. And then the naturalist lifted him toward the sun, and it happened. The eagle began to tremble. Slowly, he stretched forth his wings, and at last, with a triumphant cry, he soared into the heavens. It may be that the eagle still remembers the chickens with nostalgia. But even if he occasionally revisits the chicken yard, he has never returned to living daily life as a chicken. He was an eagle, although he had been kept and tamed as a chicken. Just like the eagle, some people have learned to think of themselves as something less than they really are, less than God created them to be, and they can decide in favor of who they really are, but they have to have God's help to do that, to lift them high and help them to see the vision. I want to share something with you. This is called The Cow Path. Listen to the words of this poetry. One day, through primeval wood, a calf walked home as good calves should, but made a trail all bent askew, a crooked trail as all calves do. The trail was taken up the next day by a lone dog that passed that way, and then a wise bell wearer sheep pursued the trail over vale and steep, and drew the flock behind him, too as all good bell weathers do. And from that day, over hill and glade, through old woods a path was made, and many folks wound in and out, dodged and turned and bent about, and uttered words of righteous wrath. Because twas such a crooked path, but they still followed, do not laugh, the first migrations of that calf. This crooked lane became a road, where many a poor horse, with his load, toiled on beneath the burning sun, and traveled some three miles in one, and thus a century and a half they trod the footsteps of that calf. The road, before they were aware, became a crowded thoroughfare, and soon the central street was this of a renowned metropolis. And people, two centuries and a half, trod in the footsteps of that calf. They followed still this crooked way and lost a hundred years a day, and thus such a reverence is lent to well-established precedents. A moral lesson might teach, were I ordained and called to preach, for people are prone to go it blind along the cow paths of their minds and work away from sun to sun and do what others have always done. They follow in the beaten track 
and out and in, forth and back, and still their devious course pursued to keep the path that others do, and how the old wise would gods laugh who saw that first primeval calf. My friend, every day you are to walk in the light of your faith in God, even though you do not yet know the destination, even though you may only see the next step, you are to walk as far as you can see, as far as you are guided. Remember who you are. You are a son. You are a daughter of the Most High. You are not to be blinded by the path of others. You are not a robot. You are a co-creator with God. Most people choose to live in secondary thought. Other people think something, then they choose to follow by thinking the same. They never question. But you are an original thinker with God. You can invent and you can create. You must go beyond the borders of your own fears. Courage does not mean never being afraid. It means to go on doing what is right even though you are afraid. Human beings are like tea bags. We really don't know how strong we are until sometimes we're in hot water. And then we have to invent a new way. We have to invent a way to survive. And often when we do, we let God's light shine through us for the good of us and for the good of many others. We are here in this life to work with God to make a difference. Here's a humorous question. What if, as your fate, you had to come back into another lifetime, into the situations that you have created for others? If that were true, what would you create? The thing that makes people and rivers crooked is often following the path of least resistance. It's not always the best way. We're here to follow the path of letting our light shine. And what is following the path of Jesus Christ? It is following the path of the guidance of God. Because the guidance of God is your light. An ad appeared in a London newspaper many years ago. And it said this, Men wanted for a hazardous journey. Small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return doubtful, honor and recognition in case of success. The ad was signed by Sir Ernest Shackleton, Arctic Explorer. Thousands responded instantly to the call. They were ready to sacrifice everything for the elation of adventure and uncertain honor. We should do the same as children of God. And why don't we? Because sometimes we are afraid. Often when one talks about being afraid, we immediately picture soldiers in war or emergency crisis situations. But actually, often courage rises in the individual during desperate times. Instead of being afraid, they become quite courageous. Being afraid often happens in ordinary ways on ordinary days. For instance, are we afraid of life? When we are afraid to listen, we only talk. When we're afraid to be with others, we make sure that we are alone. Are we afraid to make good friendships? Are we afraid that we might reveal too much about ourselves? 
Are we afraid to touch and be touched? Are we afraid of letting our own defenses down? Are we afraid to recommit ourselves? Are we afraid of success? Are we afraid to try again? Are we afraid to forgive? There are rules, you know, for being human. I would like to share some of these rules with you. Rule number one, you will receive a body. You may like it, you may hate it, but it will be yours for the entire period this time around. Rule two, you're going to learn lessons and you're going to be enrolled in a full-time informal school called life. Each day in this school, you'll have the opportunity to learn lessons. You may like the lessons or think them stupid. Rule number three, there are no mistakes, only lessons. Growth is a process of trial and error and experimentation. The failed experiments are as much a process of the experience that ultimately works. Rule number four. A lesson is repeated until learned. A lesson will be presented to you in various forms until you learn it. And when you have learned it, then you can go on to the next lesson. Rule number five. Learning lessons does not end. There is no part of life that can, does not contain lessons in it. If you are alive, there are lessons to be learned. Rule number six. There is no better than here. When you are there, it is just a here that has become there. You will simply then obtain another there. And it will, again, look better than here. Rule number seven. Others are simply mirrors of you. You can't love or hate something about another person until it reflects to you something you love or hate about yourself. Rule number eight. What you make of your life is up to you. You have all the tools and the resources that you need. What you make of them is up to you. The choice is yours. Rule number nine. The answers lie within you. The answers to life's questions lie inside of you. All you have to do is turn to God in the silence of prayer, look, listen, and trust. Rule number 10, you will forget all of this. And that is why we need church. Church is a remembrance society to come again and to recall and remember what we already know is true at the core of our being. You are a religious symbol of your religion wherever you go, so let your light shine. Follow Jesus Christ by taking on his teachings and walking as Jesus Christ walked, letting your light shine, becoming a point of light in the world. Once upon a time, there was a Bishop Tucker of Uganda. He was an artist. But how did he become a bishop? One day he was painting a picture of a poor woman, thinly clad, pressing a baby to her bosom, wandering homeless on a stormy night in a dark, des deserted street. And as the picture grew, the artist suddenly threw down his brush, exclaiming, Instead of merely painting the lost, I will go out and save them. And he went to Africa. 
Here's another story. There was a man who walked the beach in Hawaii. There were hundreds and hundreds, perhaps thousands of starfish on the beach. And it was a hot day. There was this one lone man out there throwing the starfish one by one back into the sea as quickly as possible because they would die in the hot sun. Another gentleman came up to the young gentleman who was working as hard as he possibly could throwing those starfish back into the water and he said, why are you doing this? You can't possibly make a difference. The man said, it makes a major difference to the starfish that I throw back into the sea and so it does. You will make a major difference to the people that you touch in your lifetime. With God's ever-present help, you must go beyond the borders of your fears and find new courage to be a light in your world. You must go above the beasts of the field, the fish of the sea, because you are human. The gift and the opportunity are one. You need to begin to walk the talk, to walk with God. And we can't just preach it, we must live it. There's a story told of one night in 1935. Mayor LaGuardia was in his city of New York, and he showed up in night court in one of the poorest wards of the city. He dismissed the judge for the evening and he took over the bench. One case involved an elderly woman who was caught stealing bread to feed her grandchildren. LaGuardia said, I've got to punish you ten dollars or ten nights in jail. And as he spoke he threw ten dollars into his hat. And then he fined everyone in the courtroom 50 cents for living in a city where a person has to steal bread so that her grandchildren can eat. The hat was passed around and the woman left the courtroom with her fine paid and an additional $47.50. That woman, like the servant in Jesus' parable, certainly had reason to show mercy to others. Showing mercy because we have received is what Christ is teaching about in Matthew 18. The servant's enormous debt was canceled. But then he showed no mercy to one who owed him a very small amount. And when the master heard about it, he had the heartless man arrested and punished. Receiving God's mercy obliges us to show mercy to others. If we refuse, we will be giving evidence that we don't fully or completely understand what Christ has done for us. People receive mercy and they should be merciful to others. And this is talking about a lot more than just the word mercy. If we receive the love of God, we must give that love away. If we receive the forgiveness of God, we must forgive others. Light takes many forms. There is a story told about the beginning of the Reformation. There was a man by the name of Martin of Bastille. He came to the knowledge of God's truth, but he was very afraid to make a public confession. So he wrote on a leaf of parchment. He wrote these words, O merciful Christ, I know that I know the truth. O holy Jesus, I acknowledge thy sufferings for me. 
I love thee, I love thee, I love thee. And then, with this covenant that he wrote in his own hand, he removed a stone from the wall of his chamber and he hid it. It was not to be discovered until 200 years later. About the same time, Martin Luther found the truth as it was in Christ. And he said out loud in a public area, My Lord has shown mercy to me before men, and I will show mercy to men before kings. The world knows what followed. We've all heard of Martin Luther, but we have never heard of Martin of Bastille. Why? Because they both had conviction. They both wrote a covenant, but one put the covenant in the wall and the other lived it. People take your example far more seriously than your advice. Even a small star shines in the darkness. We have to walk the talk. It's good to be a Christian and know it, but it's even better to be a Christian and show it. In Ephesians 5, verse 8, it says, Now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. There's a story of an old woman. She had a tattered bag, and she held it close to her. And in that tattered bag, she discovered something one day. She discovered her dream. She pulled out her dream, and it was all dusty. It was dirty. Through God's guidance, she was told to shine it up a bit, and she started to shine it. A bit of a reflection came out, and although you couldn't see much in the reflection, she was told to keep shining, for it would show her the answers to her dreams. So she kept shining and shining and shining, and pretty soon it had a full reflection that showed to be absolutely young and absolutely filled with hope. It was a mirror. The mirror says to you today that you are a point of light. You can go further than you thought that you ever could because you are not alone. God is with you. At times, there have been lessons in life that have knocked you down. But that's not going to stop you now. You are here on a mission. Every person is on a mission of God. You need to strive for excellence in your own individual life. It is said that excellence in a human being is this, caring more for others than they think is wise, risking more than others think is safe, dreaming more than others think is practical, expecting more than others think is possible. Is there a difference in God's mercy versus our mercy? Today, I spiritually urge you to pray your own covenant and then act on it daily. Take out your dreams again. Shine them up. And then help others to shine up their own dreams. Know that your life is more than, than just existence. It is a mission. It is following the Master. And you do it all every moment with God-given excellence. I want to read you something that touched my heart. It's by Debbie Thompson. Listen to these words. 
She writes, when I was 14, I begged my parents to let me go to Selma and march with the civil rights workers there. The next summer, I read Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird. Finch was my hero, along with Martin Luther King. My parents didn't let me go to Selma, so I stayed home. And I read books about the Holocaust and how the Danes smuggled Jews to Sweden and how other courageous people fought against the Nazis. I yearned for some sort of crisis where I could prove my merit and be true to my deep ideals. Of course, I could save the world, but I needed causes where good and evil were clearly defined. Instead, there seemed to be a whole lot of gray out there. As the years went by, I began to realize that a lot of injustice was fairly subtle stuff. True heroes and heroines didn't wait for situations of historic proportions. Instead, they did what they could in small ways. The people I admired most were those who treated all people with kindness and respect in their everyday dealings at work and at home. One person I knew refused membership in the Rotary Club when invited to join because they did not accept women members at the time. How can I join a club, he said, when they would not invite my own daughter to join if she had the same professional status as I have. One Rotarian later told me that those words had shaken him. He said he didn't condemn us. He just stated why he couldn't become a Rotary member. I went home that night and looked at my own daughter and I felt lousy. I think everybody did. By the time the Supreme Court ruled against the Rotary's discrimination, at least one Wisconsin Rotary group jumped the chance to include women members. The people, she writes, I admired most in my life gave to charities that I once looked upon with disdain. While I was boycotting lettuce, the Salvation Army was providing shelter for homeless families. While I was buying politically correct tomato sauce, the Red Cross was helping families who had lost everything in disasters of one kind or another. About the time I realized that I couldn't save the world, I realized I didn't have to, at least not all by myself. There were plenty of people out there doing their part to make the world whole. And I learned that love and forgiveness are transformative. So I forgave myself for not doing more and started doing what I could where I was. I could affirm each person that came in contact with me that day that I could give some time and some money to some good causes, and I could lend support to the wonderful folks out there who make a difference. I could become a point of light. The bottom line of this sermon is this. We are all points of light, and we can all walk in the light of God. We are all in this together. We must share what we have. It's not easy for people to do some things, but they're willing to do it because they can serve God by doing it and becoming a point of light. There is a spiritual point where you can no longer walk away. You have to stand up straight and tall and mean the words that you say. You have to do it because it is right, because you have to become part of the dedicated army of quiet volunteers reaching out to feed the hungry, 
reaching out to save the land, reaching out to help your fellow human beings. You have to become a broadcast believer, taking time to teach the children that there isn't anything that they cannot do. To become a point of light, to be a ray of hope in the dark, darkest night of people's souls. It is said in the Bible, his master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you now over much. Enter in to the joy of your master. Matthew 25 verse 21. Do what you can right now. Remember your light shines only as far as the next person that you come in contact with. There will be many today who take the following pledge to become a point of light. And I pray that a year from today there will be some who are still practicing this new way of life. Many thousands of lives I pray are changed because of the rays of hope that we project into humanity. Here is the point of light pledge. If I see darkness, dear God, I agree to become your point of light. One person can make a difference, and that person is me. And now I ask you to say that with me. If I see darkness, dear God, I agree to become your point of light. One person can make a difference, and that person is me. Let us pray. I hereby dedicate myself, my time, my money, all that I have and all that I expect to have to the spirit of God's truth and through it to my daily life. I am thankful that God shall render unto me an equivalent for this dedication in peace of mind health of body, wisdom, understanding, love, life, and abundant supply of all things necessary to meet every want without my making any of these the object of my existence. In the name of Jesus Christ, Amen.